this, can you hear me okay? All right. Great. that. Um, I, I want to talk to you about a, um, what's next for MOFs, metal organic frameworks, and uh, um, I, I just want to say that following the previous speaker, I feel rather stressed. I always tell my students, you know, there, there are two ways of knowing how to do a good thing. One is to, is to know how to do a good thing, and the other is to know how to do a bad thing so that you don't do it again. And so this is an example of a bad presentation. Um, <laughs> OK, I'd like to uh, introduce, uh, I think some of you may know about this uh, new class of materials, and others uh, may have heard about them. But I'd like to introduce them uh, as materials that are made by linking organic and inorganic units to make really a wide variety of frameworks that are in need of your expertise at this point in terms of characterization, understanding their uh, various aspects of their chemistry. I'd like to show you how one can use that chemistry to achieve really the highest porosity ever achieved in materials, and furthermore, the highest pore openings of any crystalline porous material. Then I'd like to share with you what the future is uh, uh, in store for MOFs and how one can introduce multiple functionalities within the pores and perhaps, if we can stretch our imaginations a little bit, design sequences just like sequences within DNA but sequences within MOFs to code for particular properties. And, uh, and then I'd like to update you on some activities and how a lot of this is related to um, a lot of the great work that's being done at the Molecular Foundry. Let me introduce metal organic frameworks in the following way. If I take um, nanoparticles, let's say, uh, let's, let's say that they're shaped as cubes with six nanometer size on, a, on an edge. Uh, if you calculate the surface area of such cubes, you find that it's around 2,000 square meters per cubic centimeter. Okay, and that's not an achievable surface area in nanochemistry because when you make these nanoparticles, they adhere to each other, preventing access to the, to the surface. And so what really metal organic frameworks have figured out how to, uh, uh, how to achieve this is to use hollow cubes and link them together. If you do that and you calculate the surface area provided by these scaffold, um, let's say the scaffold is based on phenylene, phenylene units, you find that in fact you should get around 2,000 square meters per cubic centimeter. And indeed, if you could make the scaffolding uh, architecturally stable, it should be possible to not only get that surface area, but of course that that surface area would be accessible. So that's really uh, the idea. And in order to um, bring this idea to fruition, the way we think in this kind of chemistry is that we think of any kind of structure that we uh, imagine as, a co as composed of two components. One component is a branching point, and the other component is the link that joins these branching points together. And um, I was trained as an inorganic chemist, so to me, this is nothing more than a metal ion or a cluster of metal ions that have a definite geometry, in this case, a six-way intersection. And then our idea was to link these inorganic units with organic units to produce this extended structure. And very early on, we chose components like terephthalic acid, the main component of plastics and zinc oxide, the main component of sunscreen, to make the first metal organic framework that's really in the image of the uh, hollow architecture that I showed you early on. It's made from metal oxide intersections and organic units linking those together with the yellow ball indicating the space that would be accessible should these architectures be stable. And indeed, we showed many times over 
that these are architecturally stable and gases and molecules can diffuse in and out of the pores without affecting the architectural integrity of the framework. But more importantly is that once you know the conditions under which these metal oxide units could be made and assembled, one can vary the organic units to include various functionalities. And therefore, if you think about a reaction happening inside the pore, now you have a way to fashion the uh, uh, interior of the pores by way of functionalizing the pores. Also, another very important thing we discovered early on was that you can expand the metrics of the system without changing the underlying topology. And that's quite powerful because it allows you to design. Generally speaking, with solid state materials, when you try to change, let's say, their functionality or their metrics, um, you, you actually make new kind of structures based on new topologies and destroy the original architecture. And here we preserve the architecture even after functionalization, after expansion of the pores. This is what the material would look like. It's an extended structure, and the yellow balls indicate almost 60% of the crystal is just open space. When we synthesize the material, uh, the, uh, the space is filled with organic solvents. And so um, to fully characterize the porosity of this material, we took single crystal of, let's say, MOF5 in this case, and... Uh, and, and did single crystal X-ray diffraction at 30 Kelvin. The crystal was evacuated without losing its architectural stability or without um, introducing a lot of defects as to prevent its monocrystallinity. And we examined this by single crystal X-ray to find that indeed the framework is maintained in the absence of guess. This is the thermal ellipsoids at 90%. This is a structure that's done at 30 Kelvin. But the key here was uh, to understand where, let's say, a gas molecule, when, it's diffused, when it diffuses through the pores, where does it sit in the framework? Because as chemists, we know that if we know the binding site for molecules, we can functionalize or play with the electronics of that um, active site in order to enhance, the, say, the adsorptive properties. And in this case, MOFs uh, already have been... Um, uh, viewed as great materials for hydrogen storage, natural gas storage, and carbon dioxide capture. Well, we found that, in fact, when you start introducing gases like argon or dinitrogen, that you do find localized electron density for argon and nitrogen on this metal oxide groove. And, in fact, to our surprise, we found that not just that the metal oxide has many different metal, uh, um, excuse me, gas binding sites, but also that the organic, both the face of the six-membered rings and the edges act as adsorptive sites for uh, uh, in-metal organic frameworks. This was very exciting because it meant that everything in the MOF potentially can be an adsorptive site. And so that could give us maximum adsorptive capacity. And the fact that the edges are also adsorptive sites made us think more about how to design structures that are replete with open faces but also open edges. And so the more exposed the edges are, the higher the, your surface area is going to be. And the nice thing about MOF chemistry is that you can take those metal oxide branching units and link them up with organic branching units to make extended structures that are replete with open faces and open edges for gas molecules to sit on. And this, when we made this, we called this, this is a new net, and it's, it's, we called it the queen of moths. Uh, because we didn't think we could make a more porous structure than this, since the surface area, as you can see here from the nitrogen adsorption isotherms, here the nitrogen goes in and then fills the pores, and then we can take it out and this is a signature, this knee, sharp knee, is a signature of permanent porosity of the structure as gases diffuse in and out. The surface area was 4,500 meters square per gram. Now we are able to um, uh, evacuate the pores very efficiently and get even 6,000 meters square per gram. That's, that's around four times the previous record held by porous carbon 
and by other porous materials, both crystalline and non-crystalline. In this case, MOFs are crystalline. They have well-defined structures, and as I showed you, uh, the components of which can be varied. And so uh, then the race um, has begun or began after that report on an international level to try to beat that record. And so in my own laboratory, we made some of these um, or these links and tested their porosity, predicting even higher, uh, higher uh, 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 surface areas. And you can see here, not only can we make the queen of MOFs, which we called MOF-177, but also its expanded analogs and other structures, again, with maximally exposed faces and edges. And you can see here that our original MOF-5, which has a surface area of about um, 3,000 meters per square per gram. Um, this is MOF-177, and this is the most recent MOF, um, MOF-200. You can see here gas uptake and, 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 and evacuation of the pores with a signature isotherm. The structure looks like this. This is MOF-200. This is supposed to be rotating on the screen. But the Langmuir surface area is 10,000 meters per, per gram. And that's about several football fields for every gram of material. So if I take a gram of material, which is no more than that high, and I unravel it to its atomic level, it could cover a couple of football fields. And that's, that's really the space that is available to bind gases or to store gases like hydrogen and methane and carbon dioxide. The key here that is unlike other porous materials, here the, the materials are entirely composed of uh, edges and open uh, faces of six-membered rings, and therefore the entire structure, everything you see in the structure is a binding site for uh, gas molecules. And uh, so this really started an avalanche of studies of combining organics and inorganics, and now just this year alone, over 3,000 MOFs have been made and reported. And so uh, I mentioned the race for uh, high surface area materials. These are the traditional materials some of you may know about, zeolites and silicas and porous carbon. And these are the MOFs um, variously uh, shaped in order to maximize the surface area. So the most recent study about a year ago uh, or two years ago now MOF 200 is around in excess of 10,000 meters per, per gram. Can we make materials that have even higher surface area? And the answer is yes. If you go to links that are not phenylene units, but let's say acetylenic units, you should be able to get, if you, if you do that for a structural motif like this, you should be able to get almost 18,000 meters square per gram. And so this is ideal materials to store gases, and, and I... I mentioned hydrogen and I mentioned carbon dioxide, and both of those um, uh, MOFs figure prominently in, the, in, in, their in those applications. But I want to talk about methane because methane is a transitional fuel. It's cleaner than oil, and it is one that, uh, that is already in, in the market with, uh, with MOFs. It's two-thirds of our... Uh, fossil fuels are stored in natural gas, and it's the least used uh, uh, fossil fuel. It will be used more and more, and already um, chemical companies are focusing on that. So we work with BASF, the largest chemical company in the world, to apply these materials not just for gas storage but for other applications. In this case, methane storage in MOF 177 at room temperature shows an exceptional um, uh, uptake capacity. This is the tank, behavior of a tank, um, a vessel in your, in your laboratory, where we're plotting here the amount up to, uh, stored in that tank versus pressure. And if you look at the same tank filled with MOF-177 powder, this is the total uptake of natural gas without changing, let's say, a pressure or the temperature. So at any given pressure, you're storing at least double the amount that you would store in a tank that does not have a MOF. And this was quite compelling as to do this really brave experiment, which is to equip an automobile with a natural gas uh, MOF tank and drive this, the automobile all over the world uh, to show that, indeed, no matter where the gas is 
um, produced and used and without purification of the natural gas. It's the natural gas that is supplied to the uh, methane uh, MOF uh, fuel tank is that that is received in, your, in the kitchen at these locales. And at the end of this experiment, which spanned 28,000 kilometers, uh, the MOF only lost 10% of its porosity. And so really this is very exciting because uh, as of today, the MOFs have been tested by VSF for over 1,000, uh, 100,000 cycles and for the lifetime of an automobile. And at the end of your the lifetime of the automobile, uh, the MOF material, first of all, never has to be changed, never has to be regenerated um, as you fuel and defuel or use the fuel, but it can sit in the car for as long as um, for the lifetime of the car. And then at the end of this, one can take the solid, add strong acid, dissociate the components into the original components and re reassemble them into that MOF or even other MOF. So, so it is potentially a zero discharge process. The MOFs originally were not stable, highly stable in uh, water, but recently zirconium MOFs have shown exceptional uh, chemical uh, Stability. So MOFs in general are very stable, thermally stable up to 300 or to 500 degrees C. Uh, that is routinely known for MOFs because they're made from very strong bonds, metal oxygen bonds and carbon oxygen bonds and carbon carbon bonds. Uh, but the challenge for a while was uh, could we have them sit in water? Could they be prepared in water? Could they be made to be chemically stable in acid and base? And finally that dream has come true with these zirconium MOFs. You can see a variety of them could be made and indeed one can uh, put them in a product, polar solvents and water and, and acetic acid without changing their uh, underlying ordered structure. These are a couple of MOFs we recently uh, reported that are made from zirconium uh, building units and organic building units. Now, I intentionally have not said anything about the guests that are in the pore when you make the material. That's because we know very little about them. And so this is an opportunity, I think, for this audience to collaborate with the MOF community on trying to figure out what is the role of guests in the pores as the material is being made. We also don't know anything about the nucleation of these crystals uh, while we are in, um, at um, at the seeding and, uh, and crystal growth uh, intervals. Again, that's an opportunity to do uh, studies that delineate that and trying to influence what kind of um, uh, frameworks could be, could be designed. So there's a lot of opportunity there. We know a lot about how to make the frameworks and how to functionalize them. We know very little about what goes on in the, in the pores aside from where gases bind. So there's a lot of opportunities there. So far, the MOFs I've discussed have pores that are as large as, let's say, one phenylene unit or two phenylene units stuck together. But um, to really be able to bind molecules much larger than that, let's say proteins, we need to be able to open up the pore opening to allow very large molecules to pass through and be able to perform chemistry on such molecules. So in order to do that, we moved away from the discrete metal oxide building units that I've been talking about and used rod-based building units, as you see here. You could use rod metal oxide units, in this case zinc oxide units, that are linked, linked by, by phenylene. And the rods here are arranged in hexagonal fashion, and they are linked by organics to make a one-dimensional porous structure. Uh, it turns out that this actually is another fertile ground for making MOFs, and in fact, there are many different ways of arranging rods, not just in hexagonal form, but in cubic form and Kagome lattice form. All these rods can be arranged in the way you see here using the color and uh, pointing into the frame, into the uh, board, in this case, pointing uh, opposite to each other, but always linked by these gray units, which are, would be the organic units. So these, all these, uh, allow us to uh, overcome a difficulty with 
MOF structure, which is, has been the interpenetration, which as you open the pore, oftentimes you have frameworks that catenate or interlock mechanically so as to reduce porosity and make more stable structures. Well, we made some of these rod-based structures, and I want to focus on one of them, which is the hexagonal arrangement of metal oxides uh, linked by organic, and that's MOF-74, we reported in 2005. In MOF-74, you have a, uh, a rod of metal oxide. This could be zinc oxide or magnesium oxide, and the rods, again here, uh, pointing into the screen, linked by organic unit, in this case, this phenylene uh, unit. It turns out this is one of the stars for hydrogen storage and has really very interesting carbon dioxide capture properties, but it does not interpenetrate, and so it was a nice structure to expand uh, its pores. And so this is the original link for MOF 74, and we collaborated with Fraser Stoddard to make these links and adding incrementally one phenylene units or more as you go along. And sometimes to enhance the solubility of these links to make the uh, ultimately the morphine crystalline form, we needed to functionalize them with um, uh, uh, organic units to enhance their solubility by breaking the pi pi interaction in the, in the solid. But nevertheless, it turns out that um, a very clever student I have, his name is Hekshang Deng, led a team of researchers in my group to actually be able to make a dream come true, and that is to be able to link a rod-like link uh, in this uh, of, of 11 phenylene units, which I've never dreamed that would, we would succeed in doing, uh, to make a MOF out of that and, of course, very large pore aperture. So the pore aperture, let's say, for the original MOF containing one phenylene unit is 14 by 10, and I'm going to zip through these. Um, two phenylene units, uh, you go to a pore aperture of 20 by 16, and you can see a very nice sharp XRD. These are not single crystal structures. They're based on powder diffraction uh, data. This is the um, uh, experimental. This is the predicted. And since we're only expanding the pore, we can predict what the XRD looks like. But I'd like you to focus on the XRDs because they become lousier and lousier as the pores become larger and larger because, because most of the crystal or most of the material is really disordered guest molecules that are floating in the pores. And, and so three phenylene units get you to 27 by 22, and, and the XRD is still sharp and nice. Um, four phenylene units, 33 by 28. And now you can see slight broadening here beginning to creep up. Uh, five phenylene units, 41 by 35, and that was the previous record for any porous crystal for, in terms of pore aperture. And so we, uh, we have now six, 49 by 41, six phenylene units, and seven phenylene units to 58 by 49, nine phenylene units, and very lousy XRD, but nevertheless, I think we can say convincingly that we have uh, that framework. And then 11 phenylene units to get to 98 by 85 pore opening. And a very broad XRD, but again, we have the 110, very indicative of that framework structure. The opening of the pore, which is the object here, has 250. 82 atoms. That's the mouth of, the, of this porous crystal. And it turns out that, I won't go through the details of this, but it turns out that they have predictable gas absorptive behavior. Um, we don't really want to expand the pores for gas storage, but rather for the binding of large molecules. Since for gas storage, you have to increase the surface area and make sure that the pore size is, that, uh, is, is on the order of the size of a gas molecule. So indeed, the largest, or some of the largest members of the series take up myoglobin. And uh, here you can, say, you can see the uptake of myoglobin from solution or depletion from solution. We can also bind uh, proteins as large as GFP into the pores. So again, a lot of things could be done here uh, again, in this community, it would be nice 
to put proteins in the pores that are very difficult to crystallize, but maybe can be ordered and examined within the pores of MOFs. So what have been done here with MOFs is that we have transformed really the chemistry of linking building units together from the weak bond regime into the strong bond regime, which previously thought people thought that is inaccessible regime because as the bonds get stronger and stronger, the crystallization problem becomes more and more uh, challenging. And so, indeed, I would like to say that while building structures from weak building units, that's the domain of supramolecular chemistry, but the control of the strong bonds, as we have shown with metal organic frameworks and some of you may know, may know we've extended this to emid isolate frameworks and covalent organic frameworks that don't have any metals in them. And we call this kind of chemistry reticular chemistry just to emphasize that it is about the control of the strong bond and making of robust materials. The making of robust materials is really extends to the future of material synthesis and materials discovery. And let me just show you that if you step back and you think about all the materials that have been made and used um, in, you know, within this century and last century, they've all been based on one kind of building block linked by strong bonds, two kind of building block or three kind of building blocks. This includes polymers and zeolites and alloys, silicon, metal oxides. A lot of the useful materials have been based on either one, two, or three kind of building units and rarely on uh, four or five different kind of building units or more. But we know from biology that uh, multiplicity of different kinds of building units gets you really um, a system that has information, that can convey information. But also it gives you tremendous functionality, control over making highly functional materials. But we can't build our entire world, our proteins and RNA, and DNA, and so we need the robustness of the materials that I'm showing here that are linked by strong bonds and the control of the strong bond to make those robust materials, but we do need to concept transfer from biology, how we can take this uh, intelligent design from biology and, and concept transfer it into synthetic materials. The reason I show this is to show that in just from three kind of, up to three kind of building units, we've created an uh, immense richness in chemistry, and that, and that more richness should be achieved by adding more and more building units. And this takes the form, so I would say that, that the materials that could be designed, that still could be designed, are far more vast than what we have already seen. And the chemistry and the tools necessary to really explore this materials beyond uh, are different than what we uh, have today. And I'll show you one problem of how this manifests itself when you have multiple building units. Once you start thinking in terms of heterogeneous number, a heterogeneous kind of building units in one material, you immediately face not just the excitement of what kind of materials you would be able to make, but also the challenge of how you're going to make them and how you're going to characterize them. And I just want to show you one example of how challenging this problem can be, but also that we have hope that we can overcome this issue of making and characterizing. So here's a moth, let's say, where the backbone, we know how to make the backbone. I think I've convinced you that there is enough moths out there that where we have control over the branching points and the organic links. But in, our, in, in, in my world, in inorganic chemistry or in molecular chemistry, every time you have a system that has many different components, as this implies, uh, the result has always been believed to, uh, to be a mixture of phases, each phase containing one of these, rather than one phase containing a mixture of those components. And that's really what we want to aim for. We want to create environments within the MOF that are decorated by many, many different building units, just like, let's say, active sites of enzymes. And also use that organic functionality to bind metals in many different kind of coordination environments and many different metals. So we're talking about the concept of heterogeneity within order. So this is not a messy system 
where you have a heterogeneous amorphous material. This is really an ordered material, but the heterogeneity is coming from these functionalities that are covalently linked to the framework. We call that controlled complexity. And so this could be done. You could take the same original phenylene units I showed you for MOP5 and functionalize it with many different functionalities and incorporate all of them within one structure because metrically they are the same and the functionalities are the same, uh, the linking functionalities. And so the organic functionality hanging off the phenylene units, as long as they don't interfere in the synthesis, you can incorporate them into the, into the structure. And we know a lot about them. We know what they are. Uh, first of all, we know we have an ordered backbone, but we know that we have disordered functionalities. The functionalities are covalently linked in the ortho position but we cannot decipher what is next to what. We know that the access to these functionalities through porosity is possible. We know the ratio of the building units through carbon-13 and MR. And, and we also know how to vary the ratios of various functionalities. So we have a lot of control over the composition of the functionalities. We know the ratio of functionalities. We know exactly where they're pinned onto the framework. But the key here, and we also know that our structures are homogeneous. If you take a crystal and you chip off the crystal um, in different fragments, you see the same ratio of functionalities from each fragment. So now comes the really, the, the big question is, uh, when you have a crystal like this that has eight different functionalities decorating the pores and you're a substrate or a molecule diffusing through the pore, you're seeing the different functionalities, uh, but, you're not, but what you can't figure out is what is next to what. What is the sequence of functionalities? So it's not a random mixture, a statistical mixture of functionalities because within each pore, okay, within each pore you have ligands or you have functionalities that bias what comes next to them just because they might be bulky or they might have different pKa for that particular link. So the system is biased to the point that, in fact, I believe that there are sequences of functionalities just like you have sequences of nucleotides in DNA. Here you have a backbone, a very robust backbone onto which you have these functionalities that convey sequence information. And so we have a collaboration with Jeff Reimer in the chemical engineering department at UC Berkeley and there we are now just exploring the idea of, of looking at spin transfer decay experiments using 2D and MR to find out what might be next to what. And it's not, you know, it's a very rough right now, but it gives us good distance information to what functionality is next to what. And the, and the question we're trying to answer is, do we have aggregation of functionalities in a crystal in this way on a nano Size, uh, nano size, or do we have a thoroughly mixed functionalities? And, the, and really the evidence, the preliminary evidence, show that in fact some functionalities like to aggregate within the pores and others like to be thoroughly mixed. So, so now I want to try to say the, the following, is that think about the interior surface of the crystal within the pores as a tiling and that that tiling has islands of particular functionality separated by other functionalities. And think about the various things that one can do if you can control the size of these islands and control the sequences of these islands within the framework. The reason this is very exciting is because when you have a structure, let's say, that has a mixture of three functionalities, it performs 400% better in, let's say, in this particular reaction of capturing carbon dioxide from a mixture of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, it does 400% better than the system that's not mixed. And it's not the sum performance of the parts. It's really much more than the sum of the, of the parts. So there is something going on within these pores that allows the material to selectively capture carbon dioxide in a much better performance than any of the components or the sum of the components. The idea of mixing functionalities can be extended to also mixing metals within the pores. That the backbone of the material of MOF 74 that I showed you 
we can introduce different metals to make, let's say, moth alloys, uh, backbones, and you can, you can put 10 different metals, maybe more, within the pore. So how are they arranged and what sort of chemistry that arrangement produces? Again, we don't know the arrangement of these metals, but this is an ideal problem that we are discussing with people at the ALS here. Think now about functionalizing the pores and then attaching to those functionalities metal complexes that are used in catalysis. So instead of having a step-by-step -step catalysis, why not put, let's say, multiple catalysts within the pore covalently linked to the framework to carry out cascade type of catalysis. So a lot of these are opportunities for research and they are, these are really not very well characterized systems as far as how are these arranged with respect to each other within, within the pores. The idea of heterogeneity within order, as I have shown you in these examples, really extends much more than just MOFs. That if you look at this example done in, a, in, a, in my group in Japan, uh, if you, uh, you want to make a metal complex from many different metals and then arrange those metals in a particular sequence, inorganic chemists tell you there is no such way. But there is a way if you try to couple that with a Merrifield synthesis method where you take the amino acids, put chelating units on there, and these would be your building blocks. You bind metals to them. And now you have metallated building blocks, and you use the Merrifield synthesis of peptides to add on, hook on each metal complex in the sequence you like. And now you've got a metal complex from many different metals arranged in very specific sequence. We could also do, that's another example of heterogeneity within order. Another example of heterogeneity within order, here's a crystal of MOF5, and here's a crystal of MOF5 riddled with holes. But here's a crystal of MOF5 where you have a heterogeneous mixture of pores macropores and mesopores within the ordered uh, system of micropores of MOF, which this study was done in a group that I'm involved in, in in Korea. And then you can go beyond that and say, well, how do we design systems that have really uh, this kind of arrangement? You have the same shape repeated, but repeated with different metrics in the same system. How do we make these systems is, again, that's a challenge that we need to address. So, so far, I've really uh, gone through the chemistry of how you build structures from covalent building units. And I have shown you the challenge of how are we going to figure out how these functionalities are arranged in the pores and whether this, if we have a way to figure out the sequences of functionalities within the pore, could those sequences be designed to code for very specific properties? I have shown you other examples of how heterogeneity within order manifests itself. And also, you'll hear from Delia Milliron on Wednesday about how this concept really is at the heart of the mesoscale that the DOE has, uh, has been uh, exploring in the community. A lot of this chemistry really goes beyond my group at this stage. And it's difficult to imagine that one single group or one single institution can, can, can really exploit this broad area that I call the molecular beyond. And therefore, I really feel that the molecular foundry, which I direct at this time, is a perfect example of, a, of an institute whose, uh, uh, um, uh, whose scientists work in a way that would really bring a lot of the chemistry, a lot of the challenges that I have shown you to fruition in terms of the making of these materials. At the foundry, we have, um, the, it's a building of six floors, and it, it spans many different fields. But a scientist in any one of these floors actually moves around the floors when they are carrying out a project with a user. And so we have these specialties, and we have about, let's say, two dozen scientists uh, personing these, uh, these facilities, and at any one time we might have 100 to 150 users that are collaborating with our, with our scientists. But this is the power of the foundry, and this is why I think this problem of heterogeneity within order is ideally suited for this environment, um, is, the, is that you have the users coming into the various floors where 
they are essentially their projects are, are managed, but they enter a sort of a chaotic world of research where there are points of intersection between floors through the scientists that are carrying out these projects. And every once in a while, we found that, in fact, these collaborating points with users and amongst the researchers at the foundry, they become very strong points of science. And they are the cutting edge. These problems are the cutting edge of what we call threads. And these threads not only pass through the floors, but also pass through our capabilities that are shown here. The thread that we've identified our strength in at the foundries, mesoscale assembly, shaping nanolite, porous crystals, bio-inspired nanomaterials, dynamic set interfaces, and the rules of design. And so really what, what the foundry does very well is break down the barriers between specialties and actually get down to solving the problem. That's why I have a lot of hope in that the foundry, and I hope in, uh, in increasing collaboration with ALS, we can address this issue of making materials in this regime of the materials beyond. We have, uh, within just the last year, have increased to record numbers the number of users of the molecular foundry. These are badge users as defined by DOE, and these are the total number of users um, ranging from um, samples and instrument use and and other people that might be uh, participating in projects. Um, I, I can't go over every single project that is going on at the foundry, but I want to highlight just a couple of or three very quickly to show you really that these early career scientists are now becoming uh, or, or have developed really mature and established groups that are capable of bringing to the forefront some really unbelievable developments. Here's a, one of the developments from our nano imaging facility, uh, a project from uh, Jim Schuck and Alex uh, Weber, uh, where they developed a, an advanced near field probe, they call the Campanile, that squeezes light to a nanometer scale uh, and allows you to acquire data without background and allows excitation detection through the same probe so that something that you see with SEM in this way, you can actually look at it and, and see the heterogeneity of the, this uh, indium phosphide nanowire through this uh, innovative probe. We have uh, individuals such as Gary Wren who have in, invented ways of taking electron uh, um, Im images of proteins and uh, analyzing them so that they can figure out exactly the topology of those proteins. And some of these proteins are not easy to crystallize in any or figure out from crystal structures. A very recent and exciting development is the ability to strip nanocrystals of their coverings. And this is done uh, uh, mainly by uh, or under the leadership of Delia Milliron and Brett Helm where they have been able to figure out a way of routinely taking, stripping nanocrystals uh, off uh, these um, uh, um, capping organic units and assemble and allow really the chemistry to go beyond what has already been possible for nanocrystals. In this case, assemble them into very large assemblages of porous materials where the building units now are nanocrystals. Um, here, this is showing the pores, and here you can see, I'm not sure if you can see the nice uh, electron diffraction uh, uh, for each of the nanocrystals. The, a lot of the materials synthesis is possible through this high throughput technique, and we have, um, we have many different um, uh, equipment to do this uh, in high throughput mode, both in terms of surveying the various compositions for a particular material, but also to be able to have uh, in high throughput form bulk uh, materials. We are also adding to the foundry now the chemistry that I showed you with metal organic frameworks, which when I came to the foundry already many have already been exploring it. So now this would be available for users in terms of high throughput crystallization of MOFs. But really, the motivation here is how do we 
at the foundry make very unusual materials and make them for the first time. Here is an, here is an object for our uh, synthesis is how do you, I, I discussed with you a lot about how do you connect building units through covalent bonds. But there is another way to do it. Uh, and that is through interlocking, mechanical interlocking of molecules. So could we use mechanical bonds to build extended structures? And what sort of properties will these materials have? Where in fact, let's say the mechanical behavior of this material involves breaking of very weak bonds, but without breaking the covalent bonds that make up the material. So, so we have a lot of ambition at the foundry to create really wonderful materials, but also we really need the collaboration with facilities like the ALS to figure out a lot of the intricacies of, of uh, what's going on within understanding the chemistry of, of these materials. So, so I want to acknowledge the contribution of my group for the research on MOFs and also the funding on MOFs was, uh, uh, was offered from these uh, funding agencies and thank you for your attention. Right, so, so the, I didn't talk about the kinetics of uh, substrates or gas molecules going in the pores and coming out. And that can be controlled first by uh, varying the pore size of the crystal, but also functionalizing the pores with bulky groups. So, so we've done, um, recently we've, we published an article, and many people have, at trapping organic molecules or fluorescent molecules in the pores and then triggering the opening of the pore and controlling the kinetics of its evolution from the pores through, through light activation. So there's a lot of work that's being done in that way. But it is by no means a well understood, you know, how the, what is the mechanism of how this happens? Because some of these, in some of these frameworks, the links do rotate. Uh, and they have a, a very uh, specific way uh, uh, to carry out dynamics just in terms of their in terms of their own movement so there's a lot of that that has to be really deciphered but yes you can control the kinetics and that's an important part of the hydrogen storage carbon capture natural gas um, um, projects Yes, so there has been a lot of preliminary work, I would say, done on uh, impregnating the moth with nanocrystals of palladium or platinum or other nanocrystals for uh, nanogold crystals, and then carrying out, you know, carbon-carbon bond formation catalysis. So there's a lot of that work that is being done. Uh, a lot of other work which is being done is to, to, to trap uh, the catalyst in a ship and bottle kind of approach, okay? And both of those, I, I would say in both of those approaches, people have observed, let's say, better selectivity, better chiral enantiomeric purity of products and things like that. But there has been no truly spectacular result, and I think because in catalysis, you really need a well-defined environment for the active site. And I think the approach that, that is now being contemplated in the community is the one that I showed where you covalently put a, a, a metal complex, covalently bound onto the framework. Then you start playing with its electronic and steric, which is very important for catalytic activity. And this has not been done. So I think there is a potential there for getting unusual, you know, or a incremental improvement in catalysis is, is much higher. The nice thing about, let's say, what I call the MTV approach, the multivariate approach, is that you can functionalize your link with a catalyst, 
But then you could also add that link without a catalyst on it, and that way you have a way of titrating in to the structure your catalyst. And so that's very important sometimes for the activity of the material. So a lot of the basic science of making the structures or the advanced research um, for the structure has is really been done, and now it's just a tweaking of the interior of the pores to get, you know, to get to better catalysis. It's uh, typically it's it's just a release of pressure. So you're pressure you're storing the gas at 60 bar or 80 bar, and then just to release it, uh, you just uh, release the you know just under vacuum. But but yes, it could be thermal activation as well by slight heating to 30 degrees C. You can you can do the same.